So what comes to mind when you hear the largest plant on the planet? Most of us will probably think of some sort of a tree. At least I did when I heard this for the first time. But as you can probably imagine, the reality is a little bit different. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton. And today we're going to be discussing this relatively new study that might have yet again discovered is the largest plant on the planet. Something that the scientists kind of suspected, but something that they did not realize until they did the genetic analysis of the plants involved. And the plant in this case is this right here, seagrass. The very unusual seagrass growing off the coast of Australia. But even though it might not sound really exciting, this seagrass is really unusual for a very important reason I'm going to discuss in a few minutes. But first, let me guide you to that previous video from possibly a few months ago about the previously known largest organism on the planet. This is still actually the largest by weight, and it's an organism you can learn more about in one of the videos in the description or somewhere right there. The organism that we refer to as Pando. It's a collection of very specific aspen trees that have created a very large and really massive colony that's, as you might learn from this video, is currently actually being eaten by certain types of deer located in this region. But in that video I briefly mentioned the existence of the Australian seagrass, which by area is technically larger. But this was not the same seagrass discovered in this study. That seagrass was only a few kilometers in size, and I think approximately 20 square kilometers in terms of area. But the seagrass that was analyzed in this particular study was discovered to spread across a much wider region. The current estimates suggest that it's approximately 200 square kilometers in size, and possibly extends over a stretch of approximately 180 kilometers in length literally making this the largest single organism on the planet. And that's because in this case the scientists relied on the genetic analysis, extracting the DNA from the seagrass, and then trying to see if it's actually different or if it's exactly the same. Turns out that this is a clonal organism, it's basically cloned itself over a very 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 large part of land, or technically over a large area of a seafloor located off the coast of Australia. And to be more specific, it's located in Western Australia in this region known as the Shark Bay that's somewhere right here. And to make things even more unusual, if you were to zoom in here, this is on uh, Google Earth, you can actually see some of this seagrass from outer space. And that's literally that organism, that's literally that one single clonal organism that seems to have spread across a really really wide region. A type of a seagrass known as Posidonia australis the type of a seagrass that generally only grows in shallow waters, and usually in very sunny conditions. But before I go on, some fun facts and some important information about what exactly is seagrass. So what you might have not realized about seagrass is that it's actually the only marine plant which produces flowers and fruits, and also other types of seedlings. And it does so annually, just like the ground counterpart. As a matter of fact, it's the only marine flowering plant in existence. And today it's believed that it very likely evolved from the terrestrial grass, terrestrial plants, approximately 70 to maybe 100 million years ago. Now when I originally saw the date I was actually kind of wondering if it had anything to do with that last extinction event that unfortunately resulted in the demise of dinosaurs. It happened around the same time and that's when the seagrass became a lot more prominent on the planet as well. Now obviously this is just a speculation, but it is an interesting coincidence in terms of timelines. But today the seagrasses have become very different from their land counterparts and only resemble land grass visually. But just like other plants on land, including of course certain grasses, they actually rely on a type of a pollination in order to try to spread their genes around. As you're probably aware, pollination and flowering is one of the biggest components when it comes to sexual reproduction in various plants. And pollinators, in this case bees, are super important for helping plants to evolve and for helping plants to maintain their genetic diversity and genetic health. And so seagrasses are no different. Here is an example of the seagrass flowers from this particular species in Australia. And previously it was actually believed that the pollination here was more or less natural and just done by the current itself. But the more recent studies discovered that this was not the case, that even seagrass has certain pollinators and certain creatures responsible for spreading the fruits. So for example, certain types of crustaceans, such as this one known as Thessalonida zoa, or even certain types of worms, have been shown to directly pollinate certain grasses, mostly because certain grains from the flowers tend to stick to the surface of these worms and these crustaceans, kind of similar to how it happens with the bees and the flowers on the ground. 
And because of this, and also because of how successful seagrasses are, they actually tend to form some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet, while also becoming an extremely important carbon sink and also being responsible for nitrogen fixation, performing similar functions to the terrestrial plants as well. But when it comes to reproduction, they can actually do it in two ways. The most common way for most of the seagrass is obviously sexual reproduction, using flowers, using seeds. But a slightly less common way is by simply extending their rhizomes, the underground root-like structures, which obviously a lot of plants have as well. And so this is another way for a plant to grow without the sexual reproduction. And as the rhizome emerges and as it spreads around, once in a while a stem emerges and the leaves start forming as well in order to help the roots to then conduct photosynthesis. And so basically this part right here is completely optional. And so in order to find out how many of these plants were present in Western Australia in this region known as the Shark Bay, the scientists conducted genetic analysis on various samples from various parts of the uh, Shark Bay, discovering that it was literally the same organism, genetically speaking. Which means that it's been doing this for a very, very long time, spreading across at least 180 kilometers, creating what seems to be the largest plant on the planet discovered as of 2022. Something that it's been most likely doing for at least a few thousand years, possibly up to about 8,000 years since the original formation of the Shark Bay. But what makes this particular seagrass unique and different from a lot of other seagrasses is the genes that it contains and how it was able to adapt to this. This particular seagrass in this region is what's known as polyploid. It contains twice as many chromosomes as its relatives. Now normally in sexual reproduction, half of the genes come from each of the parents. But in this case, this species carries the entire genome of each of the parents inside of it. Now that's not super unusual because there are other plants that do that, such as for example potatoes and even bananas, but in nature this often happens to various species of plants that reside in extreme environmental conditions. And mostly because these plants are generally sterile, they actually cannot reproduce sexually anymore and will also normally grow indefinitely unless something happens to them. In other words, some of these plants can continuously clone themselves over and over unless the conditions change dramatically. And we know that this region very likely formed approximately 9,000 years ago when the sea level here started to rise because of the melting of the uh, ice caps following the last ice age. And so all of the seagrass very likely started to spread back then. But what's interesting here is that this particular species of seagrass seems to actually grow in very different salinity and very different water levels suggesting that this particular species somehow adapted to survive in relatively extreme seawater conditions, able to grow in the water that's even double in salinity compared to the water elsewhere. With this entire region being covered by the seagrass that the scientists estimate could be at least 4,500 years old, but maybe as old as 8,000 years old. It's currently unknown though, simply because we don't really know the exact size, and it's hard to determine the growth rate of this particular seagrass as well. But because other seagrass, such as the one in, for example, Mediterranean, has already been discovered to be at least 100,000 years old, and also usually is quite big as well, at least 15 kilometers in size, the one right here in Australia could be even older. For all we know, it might have existed here for maybe a million years. It could have just relocated from one region to another. More importantly though, this particular seagrass seems to be extremely resilient. It already actually survived one major heat wave back in 2010-2011, where a lot of it was damaged, but it did recover within just a few years. Which is really intriguing because it managed to somehow learn to adapt without sexual reproduction. Normally we expect organisms with low genetic diversity not to survive these extreme conditions. In this case, it seems to be the opposite. The seagrass somehow was able to create the genes extremely well suited to a lot of different variability and a lot of extreme changes in the environment of this region. It also is able to grow in various types of temperatures anywhere from 17 to 30 degrees Celsius or 62 to 86 Fahrenheit and in the presence of different light conditions, different nutrients and as mentioned different salinity. So basically it somehow evolved perfect genes for seagrass and because of this it's been around for quite a long time. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't change. As a matter of fact, the scientists in this case imply that it does actually have very minor genetic mutations across the region and because of this it's still able to evolve just not as fast and not as successfully as the organism that does have sexual reproduction. So basically it's a plant that's mutating but much much slower. And because they create such important habitats and ecosystems around the planet, it's also obviously important to understand how these particular seagrasses 
are able to not just survive but thrive in these relatively difficult conditions. Although I guess for now it's just kind of cool to know that we've discovered the largest plant on the planet, at least in terms of the total area, and it's so large that we don't even know how big it is, but seems to be at least 180 kilometers in length and possibly at least 200 square kilometers in terms of the total area. The area you see right here in the image created by the scientists, or literally everything that's sort of greenish in color in the image from the Google Earth, and that is honestly a pretty big area. And that's of course just the preliminary findings. They might even discover that it has spread elsewhere and might even be present in much farther away regions. But I guess until we discover more or until we find another planet that's even larger than this, no, well, that's pretty much it. Check out that previous video about the aspen trees in the US that still represent the heaviest organism on the planet, but this one here currently beats it by the total area, and very likely by a lot of other things as well. On that note, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the one full percent t-shirt you can find in any description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye. And I guess now this particular plant needs to have some really catchy Australian name. Kinda like the name Pando that we gave to that aspen tree, which is Latin for I spread. But here I think Latin is maybe not appropriate. It really needs to have some really really funky Aussie name. So yeah, let's pick something really cool and let it stick. Anyway, see you tomorrow, bye bye.